God, would you pray for us, please? Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, and uh, mm. thank you for this King James Bible. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for being our friend. Mm. And, uh, Amen. Praise the Lord. That you uh, bless the second service. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, turn over to song number 271. 271 in the garden. Does Jesus care when my heart is pain too deeply for mirth or song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. I know 
is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when my the nameless dread and fear. As the daylight fades into deep dark shades, does he care enough to be with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed? to resist some temptation strong when for my deep grief there is no relief though the tears flow all the night long oh yes he cares I with my grief when the days are weary the long nights dreary I know my Savior cares does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dear on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks is it aught to him does he see oh yes he cares I While I was here, okay. I was able to visit all three of the places that I lived before moving back to New York and running for my life. Okay. And uh, so this place here, you know, it's, it's dear to my heart. This is where, this is where my Christian race started, right here. And so you folks are dear to my heart, and I want to see you win this Jerusalem. I want to see you make a real difference in probably one of the most liberal areas in the United States of America. you got all the opposition against you, but you also are on the winning side. You have the power within you to get the job done. And all it takes is a few good men and women of God to take a stand. You know, because the same way that a bad attitude is contagious, so is a good one. So is a good one. You know, I, I know the Bible says reprove, rebuke, exhort uh, with all long suffering and doctrine. And I believe that preaching, uh, grab the bull by the horns, uh, locked up the look up, and take it to the brook had its share of reproving and rebuking. Yeah. So tonight I'm going to bring you a message that I hope is an exhortation for you. Leave you with a good word. Amen? Amen. We do live in some of the most troublesome times. 
between COVID-19, protesting riots, a divided country, media lies, universities that brainwash our young people, economic collapse, transgenderism, and all the rest of the stuff. It reminds me that back when I lived here, I remember seeing the verse, Isaiah 520, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put light for dark and darkness for light, sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. I remember that verse, and I remember reading that thing. I go, wow. I mean, this is 42 years ago. And I remember reading that verse and saying, yeah, I don't think we're ever, in my lifetime anyway, going to get to the place where we actually call evil good and good evil. Folks, we're living it. We are living it to the 10th degree. So, you know, we turn to that good old inspired, preserved King James Bible for a little bit of encouragement tonight. Turn your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. I won't be long. Midnight is my goal. <laughs> Matthew <Amen>. chapter 9. <laughs> you know what it's, you know, when Paul preached till midnight, do you know that the Bible says he was to depart on the morrow? He, he, had to, he, had to, he had to go on a trip the next day, and he's preaching till midnight, and then Eutychus falls from the, you know, the, the third loft and dies, and then he's with him and talking till morning. He was supposed to go on a trip the next day. But something just didn't matter to him. His sleep, himself. Amen? So, you know, as much as we want to be conscious of the time, and I will be. Uh, we just, again, as I said last night, need to make sure we put first things first. Amen. Isaiah, uh, Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 1 with me. And the Bible says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Father, I need your help. Uh, please uh, move uh, as only you can. Uh, God, it's not going to be by flowery speeches or by good illustrations. It's going to be by the power of God. And I pray that you would do something for all of us in here tonight. Make us a little bit more like your son, God, that we might go home praising you. For these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. We know that the Bible says in Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings, and he hath put a new song in my mouth. Folks, no matter how bad it gets, be of good cheer. You're absolved in your afflictions. You're absolved. You're forgiven. No matter what, no matter what, no ma I mean, they could come, throw you in jail, take your life, well, I mean, take all your possessions. No matter what, you know the end of the story. You know where you're going to be forever. This is only a blip, you know, in the timeline of life. This is just a blip. And you're going to be forever with the Lord. And there's nothing anybody out there can do to change that. There's nothing anybody down there can do to change that. You are saved to the uttermost. You're absolved. You know, I know that I used to have a neighbor where I lived over at Whiskey Bottom Apartments. Uh, and that neighbor, every day, he would come out of that place. I'd say, hey, man, how you doing? He'd go, making it, that's about it. That's exactly what he said every day. Making it, that's about it. And that was our conversation. That was the extent of it, pretty much. And, but, you know, I thought about it. You know, that's a real dull, boring, depressed way to go through life. Making it, that's about it. I hope that's not your testimony. Yeah. See, as a pastor, I used to stand at the door of the church. When people would come in, I'd greet them. I'd go, hey, Brother Mike. You know, hey, sister, how are you? How you doing today? Oh, pretty good. And I'd turn to him. I'd say, I thought you were saved. Well, I am saved. And you're just doing pretty good? Yeah. Hey, ma'am, be of good cheer. You are absolved Amen. in your afflictions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We need not forget what manner of man we used to be. I remember in 1964 in upstate New York, I was six years old. And uh, we had the snowstorm of snowstorms. And the snow banks, seriously, literally, went to the gutters of the houses. To the gutters. And uh, I remember saying to my dad, I was six, my brother was five. 
I said, Dad, can we go outside and play in the snow? And he said, sure, son, as long as you stay off the snow banks. I said, okay, Dad. And this was Paul, who you're talking to now. This is Paul, who got more beatings than the other three put together. And so I went outside, and I immediately went up that snowbank, and I was grabbing onto the gutter, and I said to my brother, look at this, Rick. I'm standing on the top of the snowbank. I'm holding onto the gutter of the house. And then immediately I fell into the snowbank <laughs> up to here. And so then I tried to climb out, and every time I tried to climb out, I sank deeper. Now, you got to remember, this is about an eight-foot snow drift, and little Paul at this time is only about this tall. And I kept going deeper and deeper. Every time I moved, I'd go deeper until the point where my head was now underneath the level of the snow, and the snow was coming down on top of me. Every time I moved, more snow would come down on top of me. I was being buried alive in a snowbank. Well, my brother, being scared to death and being the smart one who wasn't on the snowbank, uh, ran to get Daddy. And all I can remember, I was six, and I remember it so vividly, looking up like this, just, I, I could see a little bit of light through the snow that was still there, and all of a sudden I saw this big paw come down over the top, and it was Dad's hand, and he said, grab hold, son. And he pulled me up and out of there. He gave me a hug, gave me a kiss, and then beat the fire out of me. <laughs> <laughs> But that's exactly what our Heavenly Father did for you and for me. Amen. Myrie Clay. I know Myrie Clay being from upstate New York. Because what would happen, we get all that snow and all that ice, and then in the springtime it would melt, it would go down into that clay, and it would make that stuff like, like a suction cup. You'd step into it with your boot, and you'd come up with a sock only. And that happened so many times because that clay didn't want to let go. It wouldn't let go. And that's the same clay that didn't want to let you go, you go, you go, you go, you go, or me go. That's the same clay, the miry clay, that didn't want to let you go, but Jesus Christ said, let go. And he put your feet on a solid rock, not clay. He put your feet on a solid rock. He established your goings. He gave you a little pat in the backside. Now get going for me. Walk for me now, and I'm going to put a new song in your mouth. Amen. Yeah. And that new song is... What causes people that we know to think we're a little peculiar? What, what happened to you? You know, again, like talking to a dog and you get that head tilt. You know, what has you, something strange, something that's happened to you. And that's the way that the world should perceive us, that we're just a little bit different. But different to a good way, where it's attracting them. Where it's, I mean, there's, a, there's some Bible believers that are peculiar in a bad way. And it repels them. We want to attract, not repel. Amen? It's important. And like I said yesterday, we better remember the day that that big old hand reached over and pulled you out. We better remember that day. Turn your Bible to Titus chapter 2. You think if you, uh, somebody, if you think of a fireman, uh, went into a burning fiery house and saved your child, rescued your child from dying, and you couldn't get to them, but they did, and they brought your child out alive, you think you'd ever forget that person? No? You think you'd ever forget their name? No. You think you'd be thankful every time you saw that person? Yeah. Yeah. Some things you just don't forget, and folks, we better never forget the day that he pulled us out. Look at Titus chapter 2 and in verse 13. You know, one thing they taught me in the Catholic school, they did give me a good education, even though they weren't very good on their religion. But uh, they taught me that an adjective described a noun. Right? Well, look at Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and let's read it without the adjectives. Looking for that hope and the appearing of the God and our Jesus Christ. You, those adjectives are in there to keep you excited and to keep you cheering about what's to come. It's a blessed hope. I hope it's not just a hope for you now. I hope it's still a blessed hope. I hope it's a glorious appearing. I hope he's still a great God. I hope he's still your Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's the adjectives that keep us excited about what's to come. Thank God for those adjectives. You know, some would have you believe that trusting in Christ will remove all your problems. <laughs> no, he's the Bengay. The problems are still there. He just makes it feel better. And that's, what he's there. that's why he's the God of all comfort. 
But I'd rather suffer, suffer affliction from the world's wrath now than to suffer affliction from God's wrath later. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 that we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah, we're not appointed to wrath, yep. but we are appointed unto afflictions. Look at Acts chapter 23. So point number one, be of good cheer. You're absolved in your afflictions. Point number two, be of good cheer. You're appointed to your afflictions. Acts chapter 23, and in verse 11, the Bible says, And the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must, look at the word must, that's an appointment, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And we know what happens in Rome. Paul gets in prison, Paul gets beheaded. You know, so yes, afflictions came Paul's way. They were appointments by God. And we keep our appointments. But, you know, we, we claim Romans 8, 28 all the time. All things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But do we believe it? Mm -hmm. Do we believe it when we're going through hard times? Mm -hmm. Do we believe it when we're going through sufferings and trials and persecutions and harassments? Do we believe it then? Or do we only believe it when good things happen to us? God maketh no mistake. Right. He puts us through different afflictions. They are appointments unto us. I mean, think about Paul at this point. He's a prisoner on a boat in a horrific storm, about to be bitten by a viper, headed to Rome to get beheaded, and God says, cheer up. God has a sense of humor. But he wanted Paul, and that's why Paul was able to say those things. Though all these things are going on around me, yet in here everything's fine. Yes, all the distress and all this stuff going on around me, but I'm not destroyed. Inside everything's great. And that's why Paul understood that the things that God put him through were for Paul's good and for God's glory. Amen. In Acts 5.41, if you remember, the disciples were told not to preach anymore. You, be, you keep your mouth shut and all the rest, and, and they put them in prison to keep them shut up. The angel of the Lord opened the prison door, let them all out. They went out to the streets preaching, 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 and then they got taken captive again uh, by the Romans, and you know, basically what ended up happening? They beat them. But what ended up happening after that at the very end of the chapter? They went there leaping and praising God that they were worthy to, to, be, to suffer shame for his name. Amen. Yes, they understood. Yes, nobody likes getting beaten up. But, they, but that was for Christ. They went through that hard time for Christ. God got glory through that. And that's why we go through hard times, Christian. And there's nothing to say that, I mean, the Bible talks about the beginning of sorrows. In the last days, you know, you know hard times are going to come. Yeah. And how are we going to go through those? Are we going to have an attitude of, this is how you thank me? This is how you thank me? You know, or are we going to go through it praising the Lord? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 with me. <coughs> how do you tenderize a steak? You poke it. <laughs> and exactly what God did to Paul the Apostle, you know, kicking against the pricks. That's exactly how Paul the Apostle put it. Acts, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 3 with me. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. They're appointments, Christian. Yeah. The hard times God puts you through are appointments. Amen. They're Amen. for your good and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Is there anything that God could bring upon you that you would curse God for? Nope. I mean, think about Job, what he went through. And in all that, the Bible says he sinned not with his mouth. Yeah. No sin. He took it that, that God, God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And man, none of us have gone through what he went through. None of us have gone through what Paul went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, whipped 39 times, five different times. Not by little pansy guards. These were Roman soldiers. Probably tearing the skin off of his back five different times, shipwrecked three different times, left in the deep, beaten, stoned, 
you know, all the rest of those things. And what did Paul say? You know, that his grace should be manifest in his life. Amen. Think about Peter in jail in Acts chapter 12. Now, Peter, he was a wild man. He cut off Malchus's ear with a sword. Peter would stand up when everyone else would sit down. Peter would say, I'll walk to you on the water. Bid me to come to you on the water. Peter was a wild man. And here he is in Acts chapter 12. James was just killed with a sword. And now they take Peter because they saw it please the people. And in Acts chapter 12, he's in jail with four quaternions of soldiers. A quaternion is four soldiers. Four quaternions is 16 soldiers. And he's chained between two of them, knowing that on tomorrow he's going to get his head cut off. And he's screaming at the top of his lungs, God, I can't believe this is the position I'm in. I can't believe this is what you do to me after walking with you for three years. How can you do this? What a repayment. No, more like this. Chained between Roman soldiers. 14 or 16 guards standing around, sleeping, knowing tomorrow I'm going to get my head cut off. What would you and I do in a situation like that? You know, that's not the same Peter. The Peter that we saw in the Gospels is not the same Peter we see in Acts chapter 12. Praise God for that. And I think about Paul. You know, think about all the people that forsook Paul. Demas forsook him. You know, this guy forsook him. That guy forsook him. He had problems with Barnabas. He had problems with Alexander. He had problems. He had problems with everybody. As a matter of fact, I had, I've had people, you know, not like me, uh, diss me, want nothing more to do with me, haven't talked to me since, but I've never had an entire continent turn on me. <laughs> the Bible says all Asia has forsaken me. <laughs> That's, that's pretty amazing. But yet here he is in jail. And what does he say? Can't believe it. God, I've went, gone through all this for you, and here I am in jail. Tomorrow I'm going to get my head cut off. You know what he's saying? He says, bring me the parchments. I've got work to do. You know, I might be able to finish before tomorrow, before they take my head off. I might be able to get some of this done. Bring me the parchments, would you? Not bitter, not complaining about what he's going through. And he said, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Christian, how are you doing going through your trials? Amen. You've got them just like I do. You know why? Because God makes appointments for you just like he makes appointments for me. Amen. You're going to go through hard times. You might be going through some hard times right now. How are you handling it? Like Peter? Like Job? Like Paul? Be of good cheer. You're appointed. To your afflictions. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. And in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Amen. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. How did, how did those martyrs burn? They burned them alive. And they were singing hymns as their flesh was falling off of their bodies. How do you sing hymns in the middle of that? Instead of screaming out at the top of their lungs, they were singing. Stephen, you know, in Acts chapter 7. I mean, I, these people had something. I don't know about you, but these people had something I don't have. But I can tell you this, I want it. Because I know the times are going to get hard, harder. And I want to be able to go through it and God get glory through it. You know, Job's day of adversity, who designed that? Was it Job and his sin? No. Was it his wife? Eh, maybe. <laughs> Was it the devil? No. It wasn't the devil. Who designed it? God did. You can, you can touch him, you can't kill him. 
go ahead, do what you want. Have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright, you know, a, a righteous man, a man that doeth right, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschews evil. You can touch him, but you can't kill him. Why? So that God would get the glory. At the end of that thing in chapter 42, a perfect picture of the tribulation, what happens? The devil's foot stomping man walking out of the throne room. God humiliated him and embarrassed him because Job handled the tribulation and the trial the right way, giving God the glory. I remember in 2008, my first wife was diagnosed with severe stage four breast cancer. And um, she died in 2008, but for about a year and a half prior to that, I couldn't work. I stayed home to care for her. At night, I was having to carry her to the restroom she couldn't walk. I was carrying her to the restroom and carry her back in the middle of the night. And um, so I couldn't work. And if I couldn't work, I, you know, my, our company was small. So basically, it, it destroyed our company. I ended up having to file bankruptcy with my company. I had to file personal bankruptcy because I, I had no money. And, and my wife died in 2008. And after the funeral, my in-laws never spoke to me again. They disowned me. They thought that I was personally responsible for my wife's death and uh, so they never spoke to me again their their children which were my you know in-laws they never spoke to me again everyone disowned me it was like a bomb went off in my house all at one time and uh, that was the day of my adversity and I got to be honest with you there were times I felt like quitting there were times I felt like just turning around, walking away, and saying, this is too much for me. But I'm thankful I didn't. And I'm, th I'm thankful that God sent me another little queen. And her name was Jenny. And she blessed my life. And, uh, but I had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and keep walking. Because on the other side was another hill, another mountaintop. And that's all a valley is. It's a land in between two mountaintops. And if you keep marching, you'll eventually get to another mountaintop. And I did. And I met Jenny, and God called me into evangelism, and then one thing led to another, and we got three cats. Amen? <laughs> and I, I, now I'm having to try and put up with cats. Dogs, you know, they, they just, you know, they do what they do, and they poop in the house, and they eat your food if you're not looking, and, you know... <laughs> Cats just smell your food. They don't actually eat it. But then they claw everything they can possibly claw. And um, so, anyway, when you find the perfect pet, let me know, would you? But you know, uh, the Bible says that the more they afflicted the children of Israel in Egypt, the more they grew. The more they were afflicted, the more they grew. David said in Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus might yeah. suffer persecution. Yeah. Shall? So if you're not suffering persecution, what does that mean? There's a lack of godly living? Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. See, we had a lady in our church... Her name was Miss Kitty. And Miss Kitty lived with her family. She, I think she had four kids. But uh, they lived 105 miles away from the church. It was a two-hour drive every Sunday and every Wednesday. Now, Miss Kitty, now, not the, the drive was only part of the problem. The other problem was she had rheumatoid arthritis. She had more pins and replaced joints in her body. You can imagine sitting in a car for two hours, how she got out of that car with rheumatoid arthritis. And she would walk into our church, and you would never, ever know that she had a problem. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. How's your week been? Is there anything I can pray for you? Good, so good to see you. What a blessing it is to be here today. Isn't, it? Isn't God good? You would never know this woman was in severe pain. She, you would never see it on her face. Well, one day we got a phone call, 
And Miss Kitty says, Pastor, you got to come out. The river has overflowed its banks, and our whole valley is flooded. They were the only ones that lived in that valley. The whole valley is flooded, and the water is up to the threshold of the door. It's coming into the house. We have pets. All the kids are here. We can't get away. We can't get out. The water's too high. The, the water's rushing past us. It's too fast. Help, help, help. So I got some men from the church. We got a pickup truck. We got a boat. We took it on out there. We went out to the house. The water was absolutely into the house by this time. We got them all into the boat and got them to land safely. Now, that's a good story, but there's an even better ending to it. The insurance company cut them a check for the house, and they were able to buy the house closest to the church. And that's what God does when he gets glory, when he gets glory through the trials and the sufferings and the persecutions that he puts us through. He will reward you just like he rewarded Job. You know, because if you try hard enough, you can find the blessing in it. How many of you have ever played with Legos? You played with Legos. Put your hand up right now. We'll throw you out of here if you never play with a Lego. I mean, <laughs> yeah. But I remember playing with Legos and building them with my kids and all the rest. And if you, I was looking for a little white one with two bumps on it. Just a little white one. You know what that enabled me to do as I was looking for a white one with a, two little bumps on it? I ignored everything else. And through my mind, through my eyes, I was able to totally ignore the green ones. I ignored the blue ones. I ignored the yellow ones. I, igno I, I, was I ignored the white ones that had five bumps on them because I was looking for a little white one with two bumps on it. And I, my mind was able to ignore everything else and focus on what I was looking for. And if you try and find the blessing in what you're going through, Amen. you can find it. Yep. Yeah. You can find it. Amen. My son likes Mustangs. We took a trip out to Colorado. Man, every time a Mustang went by, oh, there's a 66 Fastback. Oh, you know, you know, the first Mustang was 1964 and a half. There's one right there. You know, and all these Mustangs, and he was naming them off. And, you know, I finally got to, we got out to Colorado, and I said to him, how many Volkswagens did you see? He goes, none. Because I wasn't looking for Volkswagens. No punch buggies. No punch buggies. I was looking for Mustangs. And if you look for the blessing and the trial that you're going through, yeah. you can find it. Amen. It depends on what you're looking for. Amen. Just like Pollyanna, play the glad game. Point number three, be of good cheer. You're accompanied in your afflictions. Look at Mark chapter 6. You're accompanied in your afflictions. And in Mark chapter 6 and in verse 50, the Bible says, For they all saw him and were troubled. This is the, the disciples in a storm. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. No matter what you go through, he's going through it with you. You're accompanied by the Savior. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Never, right. never. Amen. There's nothing you can go through that he doesn't go through with you. Right. He's right there with you. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Whether it's in a fiery furnace or in a lion's den or in a storm or in a jail cell, he's right there with us. Thank you, Lord. When you're going through health concerns, he's right there with you. Yeah. You're going through financial concerns, he's right there with you. You're going through people problems, he's right there with you. Thank you Lord. Whatever the problem, you're, he's right there with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And that's why Paul was able to say in jail, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. But not only are you accompanied by the Savior, you're also accompanied by the saints. We know the verse very well in 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist, 
steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished by your brethren that are in the world. There's nothing you're going through that somebody hasn't gone through before you. There's nothing that you're going through that someone hasn't gone through before you successfully, where God got the glory, where you saw the good, where you were able to find that little white Lego with two bumps. You know, uh, I used to work out with my boys. I used to get them up every morning at 6. We went out to the shed. We'd turn on the propane heater. We'd come in and have breakfast, and then by 7 o'clock, we'd be out there working out, and the, the shed would be nice and warm. And they, I mean, they didn't really appreciate me taking them out there every day at 6 o'clock in the morning. They, I mean, they never, I, you know, to this day, they don't call me up and say, Dad, we just want to thank you for all the times you got us up at 6 to take us out to that shed to make us work out. They, they just didn't thank me for it. But, you know, one of the things they probably thanked me for is, you know, they were teenage boys at the time. And what kind of a dad would I have been had I put 300 pounds on the bar and put it on my son's chest and said, here, bench press this? It would have killed him. I love my children, and I don't love my children anywhere near as much as our Heavenly Father loves us. Amen. So what in the world, why in the world would we think that he would want to hurt us, right. that he would want to crush us, right. that he would want to put more on us than we can bear? Right. He loves us. Yep. You know how much he puts on us? What we can bear. Right. And as we get stronger, he'll Amen. put a little bit more weight on the bar, sure. a little bit more. Not 45s. He doesn't want to kill you. He'll put a little five on there. He'll make it a little harder the next time. And when you get that one and you get it successfully, Amen. he'll put a little more on that bar. That's how you, yeah. how, that's how you go from Thank getting Lord. saved to one day being a pastor. Amen. A little at a time. Amen. He doesn't want to crush you. Christian, God's not put more on you than you can bear. Yeah, that's true. And if, you, if you're there thinking that this is more than I can handle, you got to look for that little white Lego. There's something good in it. There's something good in it. Someone's watching you. We're not islands. Someone's watching you, and you are either encouraging or discouraging. And if we can give God the glory through what we go through, because remember, we're appointed unto it. And as we go through it, if God gets the glory, it's for our good. Amen? Be of good cheer. You're accompanied in your afflictions. You know, sometimes we like to take the path of least resistance. We don't want to go through it. David said, by my God, have I run through a troop. By my God, have I leaped over a wall. You know, sometimes we don't want to go through it. We'll go around it. So that's when we pull out the credit cards and all the rest, you know. <laughs> and we try and take matters into our own hands. There was this guy that was uh, uh, walking on a trail, just on a hike. And all of a sudden, he saw uh, this cocoon with a caterpillar in it. But the caterpillar was getting ready to break out of the cocoon and become a butterfly. And he thought he saw that caterpillar struggling and struggling. It was now a butterfly, struggling and struggling to get out of that cocoon. So he thought he would do it a favor and took out his little pen knife and he cut the cocoon. And the butterfly fell to the ground and died. Because it was the exertion of getting out of that cocoon that strengthened his wings to one day be able to fly. And without the exertion, those wings were not strong enough. He fell to the ground and died. You don't need to take the path of least resistance. Go through it with God. Amen. I said Amen. with God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. Faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. Amen. It is God. It is God. It is God. <laughs> And like I said, for by my God have I run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. Amen. Let God be God. I can do some things through Christ which strengtheneth me. <laughs> you know, we might read a perfect version, but sometimes we don't live a perfect version. Yeah, that's right. And point number four, be of good cheer, you're able in your afflictions. Turn to John chapter 16. Have you not heard the verse, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man? 
But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Amen. Yeah. Able. Be of good cheer, you're able in your afflictions. John chapter 16, look at verse 33. These things have I, I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If Christ is in you, then you also have the ability to overcome the world. You have the ability to overcome the flesh. You have the ability to overcome the world. You have a, the ability to overcome the devil because Christ lives in you. Amen. Do you ever notice that hurricanes have very little effect on palm trees? After a hurricane wipe comes whipping through, buildings all torn apart, but yet you see those palm trees just standing there. Why? Because they flex with the storm. They flex with the storm. And those palm trees are down there where the hurricanes are. There's no hurricanes up here. We don't need palm. But down there, that's what God put those palm trees just where they needed to be, where the hurricanes hit. And those things don't break with the storm. They bend. And Christian, we need to be a little bit more flexible and allow God to do with us what he pleases. Amen. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. Amen. He bought us. Allow him to do with us Lord. as he will. Yes. yes, you know, we're able. I, I'm going to tell on myself. A few years ago, we had to go to the Jubilee down in, in uh, Jacksonville, Brother Peacock's church. And uh, we were going to take our RV, so we're at the house. Time to get it all, you know, put together, pack it all up, get ready to go. And I needed to move our, our, tr our vehicle, our uh, Buick Enclave. So I said, Jenny, uh, where's the keys to the Enclave? She goes, I don't know. I don't know where the keys are. I said, well, they're not hanging up. And she goes, it might be in my purse. She checks her purse. She couldn't find the keys. I said, maybe in, they're in the seat cushions or something or look around for it. We couldn't find those keys anywhere. We looked for hours for those keys. Couldn't find them. So I said, I'm going to call locksmith. First locksmith comes out, and he says, no, we, we, you know, I can't do this car. You have to call another locksmith. I call another locksmith. He comes out. He says, yeah, I can do this car. And he does it, and he gives me a key. And I say, okay, great, we have a key. And I go put it up on the hook where all the keys go. And uh, shortly thereafter, Jenny finds the keys in her purse. <laughs> in a little hole in the bottom of her, way down in there, there are a couple grandkids in there, and a half-eaten peanut butter jelly sandwich. And she pulls my hair. They are. We hang them up on the rack. Next day, I go out to move the car. I grab the keys, go out, try to start the car, and it won't start. I call the locksmith. I said, car won't start. He says, what do you mean it started yesterday? I know, it's not starting today. He, and I said, oh, by the way, we found the keys. He goes, uh, what keys are you using to try and start the car? I said, I don't know, the, the ones we found. He goes, oh, that, they won't work anymore. you got to use the other ones that I made for you. That one's reprogrammed. Okay, so I, went, I got the other key, went out. Finally, finally, I'm able to move the stinking car. So we're able now to pack the RV and head down to, to Florida. We were going to see Brother Greg Reinhardt, so we went to Port St. Joe. We we're going to camp a little while before going over to Jacksonville. So we pull up into the right along the Gulf. We had a beautiful spot right there by the Gulf. And we're going to go over and see Brother Reinhardt now. So, okay, we, we go to get in the car to go over to Brother Reinhardt, and I accidentally dropped the keys in between the seats. And... As God is my witness, I looked for half an hour and couldn't find them in between the seats. A half an hour later, I looked way down in there, and I could just see a little shine. If I had tried a thousand times to fall, drop it into that hole, I never would have been able to. But it found its way in there. Finally got the keys. Jenny gets in the car. Okay, honey, let's get going over to the Brother Reinhardt's. I said, did you lock the RV? She goes, uh, no, I, no, I don't have the keys. Don't you? No, she, but she says, yeah, I think it's locked. And I go over and check it. Yeah, it's locked. And where's the keys, Jenny? She goes, I don't have the keys. Who's got the keys to the RV? And I looked inside the window, and there's the keys sitting on the table. And the RV's locked. So now I'm walking around the RV checking every window. Finally found one window about this big for a 250-pound Italian. Slide that window open, pull the picnic table over so I can get up on it, 
squeeze myself through it. Everyone, all these people are walking by looking at this big Italian sausage hanging out of the, the RV window. You know, and I, my legs are dangling out of the back like this. I finally reach in, I get in there, and I get the key, and I come out, and everything's good. Okay, we're good. Well, on the way over to the Reinhardt's, we get a little message on the radio that says, there's a storm coming, bad storm. And uh, then we get a call from the RV place where we're staying. says, you'll probably want to move your RV. Every, everyone else is kind of like leaving. And I said, Jen, I'm used to storms. I'm from Rochester, New York. I can handle a storm. So why don't we just stay? I mean, what's uh, such a pain to move it and all the rest? Well, when we got back from the Reinhardt's, there were only two RVs there, ours and somebody else's, and they weren't living in it. So we were right there on the Gulf, and all night long we were discoing, and that thing was going back and forth, and Jenny was scared to death. I, don't, I was trying to be cool. I said, honey, just fall asleep. It's just rocking you to sleep. No, no problem, honey. The next morning I get up, I walk outside, and there's fish underneath my RV. I almost became Noah's Ark part two. And so we escaped that. And I said to my wife, we're going home. I'm not going to Jacksonville. I'm going home. No more. I'm done. And my wife turns to me. She says, you can't do that to Brother Peacock. He gets, he's expecting you. We're this far. You can't turn around now. I said, no, I'm done. God, God has made it clear that I don't belong here. She said, no, honey, you got to go. You got to go. I said, all right, fine, we'll go. And I drive over to Jacksonville, and we get there late at night. And the campground is like a Tarzan movie. It's a jungle. I mean, a jungle. And I'm pulling in at like 8 o'clock at night. It's pitch black out. And they want me to take a 40-foot RV with a car behind it and do a hairpin turn to get into my campsite. I can't get in there. I said, I called the guy over. I can't get into that thing. He says, yeah, I know. You'll have to take your car off the tow dolly, your tow dolly off the RV, drive your RV around, come back, drive your car around, and then come back and hand carry the tow dolly to the site. <laughs> I said to my wife, this is fun. And I finally, after an hour, get everything into the site, and I go and plug everything up, plug it in the, the power into the RV and all the rest. No power in the RV. Call the maintenance man back. I said, we have no power coming out of our thing. And he comes over and he puts in a voltmeter in there and he checks it. He says, look, you got power there. And I go, I don't know what's going on. I got no power in my RV. I had to run the generator all night long. So now I'm discouraged with that and I'm walking back to the RV and I open the door and my black cat jumps out <laughs> in the jungle, total jungle. And I'm looking for this black cat. I mean, wouldn't you go home by now? Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm walking around looking for this black cat. And all of a sudden, I hear, ah, that cat hates me. Ah. I said, Jenny, your cat's over here. She comes over, puts her hand in there, grabs that thing by the neck. Ah. It had never been outside before, so it didn't know how to react. We finally found the cat. We're still running the generator, all night long running the generator. The next morning, I wake up, I go to the back of the RV, and I just jiggle the plug into the RV. I hadn't pushed it in all the way. So we go over to Brother Peacock's, and after we get done with one session of Brother Peacock's, we're driving back, and they said there's a storm coming up the Atlantic coast, and it's going to hit exactly at the campground. <laughs> not the middle of Jacksonville, not southern Jacksonville, directly north of Jacksonville, right at the campground. You got to move your RV and move it now. Get out of here. They cleared the entire place. We had to go to a church and plug in at somebody's church. Why did all that have to happen? I wanted to go home. But as a result of going to that Jubilee, the next year we had 35 meetings from all of the pastors that I met while being at that Jubilee. Amen. Who didn't want me there? He did everything possible. And had I not had a good wife, I would have been back in Nashville, Tennessee, because I was discouraged. And when I was going through those hard times, those trials, I wasn't giving God the glory. I wasn't looking for the little white Lego. I left it all upon me. And that's what can happen, Christian. 
The last point I want to bring you. Be of good cheer, you're approved by your afflictions. Look at Acts chapter 27. Just a few verses and we'll be done. Acts chapter 27. And in verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. When God sends affliction, he's sending a compliment that your shoulders, excuse me, are big enough to carry it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And in verse 4, very important, it says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. How? In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. How are you approved? How do you approve yourselves as a minister of God? By enduring afflictions the right way the right way. Have you ever had an attitude that you don't need to prove anything to anybody? What did Paul say to young Timothy? But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, make full proof of thy ministry. How do you prove yourself? How do you prove your ministry? How you go through afflictions. We can go through them and God gets glory, or we can go through them trying to get the glory ourselves. God needs to get that glory. Last verse, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. And when I say last verse, I mean last verse. Not like my son. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 8 with me. Paul says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus, what? Might be made manifest in our body. Amen. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If Paul called his affliction light, then we've never known any. <laughs> we've never known any. And he says it worketh a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He knew that he was going through what he did for his good and for God's glory. Look for that little white Lego. Find the good in what you're going through. And remember, Christian, be of good cheer. You're absolved. You're forgiven. Be of good cheer. You're appointed to it. Be of good cheer. You're accompanied in it, not only by the Lord, but by the brethren. Be of good cheer. You're able. God's not going to put more on you than you can bear. And be of good cheer. You're approved through your afflictions, that you're a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ.